an expert on cryptocurrency. And ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, please help me give a warm Malaysian welcome to Andreas Antonopoulos. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, good afternoon. Salam alaikum. It's uh, a real pleasure to be here. Um, it's my first time in Malaysia. I've now been in Kuala Lumpur for less than 24 hours. Uh, and I'm enjoying it a lot, uh, very much so. Uh, this is my latest book. It was published in September. It's called The Internet of Money. Um, people often find that this is a difficult topic to understand. Um, Bitcoin is a difficult topic to understand. And I've published two books on it. The first book, uh, Mastering Bitcoin, which is over there, is for uh, software developers, engineers, uh, technical people. How many people here are software developers, engineers, technical? Anyone? Okay, so five people in this room can read that book. <laughs> it explains how Bitcoin works. And, um, you can probably read the first three chapters before you get into the very technical stuff. And from that point on, it, it's a bit challenging. Um, it's challenging not because I aim it to be challenging, but because Bitcoin is a complex subject. Now, for everybody who is not a developer, uh, the reason I published that book, The Internet of Money, is this isn't about how it works. This is about why it matters. And it's a collection of 11 of my talks delivered in this format. Um, and it explains the philosophy of money, uh, the uh, implications of Bitcoin on society. And it's a book for everyone. Uh, it's the book I gave my mom to read. And she doesn't understand anything about computers or money. So that's a good start. Great. So uh, before I get started, I'd like to get a feel for. Um, the people in the audience and get a bit of an understanding of how many people are familiar with these technologies that we're going to be discussing today. So by show of hands, let's start with the narrowest, which is how many people here own Bitcoin? Okay. Someone did a good turnout for the community. Hi. Thank you for coming. Hi. Thank you for coming. Um, how many people have seen or conducted a transaction in Bitcoin, but don't own any, have just experienced it? Okay, just a few. Very good. And um, how many people have never conducted a transaction, have no idea what Bitcoin is or how it works, and are new to this topic? Great. Now, um, that was about maybe 30 people, I would say. Now, for those of you who are new to this topic, what I'd like to suggest is that whether you understand or not what we're discussing today, uh, and please ask your questions. I I'm, want to hear even the most basic questions about Bitcoin, because I believe those are the most powerful questions. After we're done with the presentation, uh, after we're done with the Q and A. I would like to see as many of the people in the audience who have never experienced Bitcoin to either install a Bitcoin wallet on your mobile device, and someone in the audience will give you for free some Bitcoin. Not a whole Bitcoin, a fraction of a Bitcoin. Just so you can see how a transaction works, and then you can turn to your friend who just started and Exchange Bitcoin with them, so you can experiment with this. I can assure you it's entirely legal. It's very easy to do. Um, and it will allow you to really experience this technology, which is much easier experience than it is explained. So, let's try uh, the next question. How many people in this audience who have Bitcoin, have Bitcoin on their mobile devices, are willing to help people install a wallet and give them one or two dollars? I will look around the new people, look around at who's raised their hands, find these people after the Q&A, ask them to give you a small amount of Bitcoin and help you set up a wallet. Don't be shy. I will be happy to do it myself. All right. With that, let's get started with Bitcoin basics. 
In October of 2008, on an obscure, anonymous mailing list called the Cypherpunk mailing list, an anonymous participant using the pseudonym Satoshi Nakamoto announced the publication of a paper and said, I think I have solved a problem in computer science. I have found a way to create a system of electronic cash that is direct between people, peer to peer, as we use the term in computer science. In this system of electronic cash, I have written a white paper and I have implemented it in software. And on that day, Satoshi Nakamoto published the white paper. You can download it online. Uh, it's available at bitcoin.org. Um, you can do a search for it, the Satoshi Nakamoto white paper or the Bitcoin white paper. And in nine pages, Satoshi Nakamoto described in detail and in ways that predicted many of the things that happened over the next seven years what Bitcoin was, and what Bitcoin could become, and how it would work. But he didn't stop there, or she didn't stop there, or they didn't stop there, because we don't know if Satoshi Nakamoto is a man, a woman, or a group of people, or an alien being from the future. Okay, probably not that last one. Satoshi Nakamoto then published software and invited people to participate in running a network. And this gives you the first hint as to how Bitcoin works. Bitcoin is software. Bitcoin is an application, among other things. You download this application, you run it on your computer. You can run it on a laptop, you can run it on a desktop, preferably on a computer that is permanently connected to the internet. It uses quite a bit of RAM and disk space right now, but in those days it was very lightweight. And if you run this program, it reaches out on the internet and it finds other people running this program. You don't know who these people are. It doesn't reach out to specific people. It creates a random mesh network, what we call a peer-to-peer -peer network, where every participant in the system is equal. There is no special computer. They are all just talking to each other. It creates what in network terms we would call a crowd. So, randomly, reaches out and connects to various other computers running the Bitcoin software. And together, they create a network. And that network is used to exchange and propagate transactions. And these transactions are encoded in a digital format. They contain information about the transfer of value and the authorization to transfer value between participants. Nobody controls this network. And this is a critical concept. Nobody controls this network. You can be running one of these computers. You do not control this network. You run one of these applications. It connects to other people. And you run another one of these applications. And it talks Bitcoin to the other computers that are talking Bitcoin. But no one is in control. No one is in charge. Just like when you're running a computer that speaks on the internet and communicates with other computers on the internet, no one is in control. If you interact directly between these systems. That network started on January 3rd, 2009, and on that day, the world changed. For the first time in the history of money, in the history of trust, in the history of institutions, in the history of humanity, 
a system that is completely independent of authority, is completely independent of institutions, a system that develops trust as the result of collaboration, communication, and computation through cryptography, was born. This system allows people to exchange value, to transmit money. And this money is called Bitcoin. So Bitcoin is the application, it's the software that you run on your computer that communicates with all of the other computers running the Bitcoin software. Bitcoin is the name of the network that runs the Bitcoin network, which is the collection of all of these computers. Some six and a half thousand of them around the world, anywhere there is internet are the ones we know that advertise their presence, several thousand more that don't, and tens of thousands that simply listen onto this network without actively participating. The Bitcoin network. And all of this is an infrastructure that is used to create and transmit value in the form of transactions expressed in a new currency, the Bitcoin currency. And the Bitcoin currency is unlike any other form of money we have ever seen before. First of all, as a form of money, it does not exist in physical form. It is the culmination of a trajectory we have seen in human history. Over thousands of years, money has become a more abstract form of value. You start with very, very tangible forms of value, commodities, a goat, a banana, a pineapple. These are very poor forms of money, because you can eat them, and they rot or die, and they can be lost. They are not very good forms of money, because they are the thing of value. We went from that to gold, precious metals, and stamped coins. These are better forms of money, because you cannot eat them. They do not die or rot. They do not represent the value itself. They are not the value. And this is an interesting concept. Money is not the valuable thing itself. Money is the thing you exchange for the valuable thing itself. The reason bananas are not good money is because bananas are the value you are trying to get. Money is the thing you exchange for bananas that has no value in itself. It is simply a symbol, an abstraction. It represents something that can be carried that I can give to someone tomorrow, and they will probably give me bananas. That future promise of value is the essence of money. So the essence of money is the ability to have an abstract token that in itself is immutable, unforgeable, eternal, maintains its value, and represents the exchange of value in the future as a promise. And over time, these things have become less and less physical and more and more abstract. Why? Because people don't like changing. And if you tell someone, I'm not going to give you bananas for the work you did, I'm going to give you a shiny gold coin, but don't worry, you can use this to get bananas. They look at you and they say, I've always had bananas for my work. I think I would like to have bananas, not this yellow thing. A hundred years later, they now believe the yellow thing is valuable. And then you tell them, now I'm going to give you a piece of paper instead of the yellow thing, but don't worry, you can still convert this into bananas. And most people say, I don't think that's real money. I want the yellow thing. And the world moves on. And eventually we change, and we say, you know what? You won't get the piece of paper either. 
you won't get the coin. You will go and look at numbers on a page or on a web page. And that represents the amount you have in the bank, but don't worry, you can still use that to acquire food, products, services. It really is money. You can't touch it, you can't see it, it's just a number. And finally, we arrive at Bitcoin. Bitcoin has no physical form. It doesn't exist in any way. It is entirely intangible. It cannot be touched. It is simply a digital form of money. But it is a digital form of money that is entirely different from everything we've seen before. What it does that is different is that it is not a form of money that is recorded in the database or records of a company. It is not a digital form of money that represents a debt owed to a central bank or government. It is not a digital form of money that has been issued by a sovereign, a central bank, a nation, a king. It is a form of digital money that has been issued through complex and energy-intensive computation on the internet, is recorded simultaneously on every computer that participates in the Bitcoin network, is validated independently by every computer that participates in the Bitcoin network, cannot be forged, cannot be counterfeited, cannot be censored, cannot be seized or frozen, can be transmitted anywhere in the world as information, can be verified independently by anyone who receives it, and is not controlled by anyone. Its value is not controlled, its issuance is not controlled, its ownership is not controlled. It is direct from one person to another person with no intermediaries. If I use my mobile phone to make a Bitcoin payment to someone in this room, I am creating a digital transaction that recognizes the fact that a certain number of Bitcoin that the network knows belongs to me through the proof of my digital signature. I have authorized the transfer of that value to another owner of Bitcoin, who will then be able to control that Bitcoin through their own digital signature, through their own cryptographic key. Now, you don't need to know anything about digital signatures or cryptographic keys. When you use Bitcoin, you see an application on your mobile device or on your desktop. This application tells you you have three Bitcoin. It allows you to enter the address of a recipient, which is a number, just like an email address. It allows you to select an amount of Bitcoin you wish to trans transact. And when you click send on your application, it uses the digital signature and private key that is embedded in your device to create and sign a transaction that is advertised to the entire Bitcoin network and says, I have transferred this value. And then the entire network now knows that this value belongs to someone else. They don't know who this someone else is. Nobody knows. When you do a Bitcoin transaction, it is not related or attached to identity. You do not need to create an account. You do not need to register. You do not need to provide ID or name or location or address, age, gender, race, religion, nationality, nothing. You don't even need to be human. And you laugh, but it is true. Bitcoin enables for the first time in human history non-human entities to actively control and own value. Which is bizarre, because we've never had that in any legal system in the world. 
We have the legal fiction of corporations, and corporations can own value, but corporations can only exist as associations between living human beings. In Bitcoin, a software agent that is not owned by anyone, through the use of cryptography, can own and transact in Bitcoin internationally. This creates some very interesting and also very disturbing possibilities for the future. Artificial intelligent systems can own and control money without any living human being involved. You can have corporations that have no directors, no living humans in control, that are controlled entirely by software. Back to people, though. If you are a person who has installed a Bitcoin wallet, you must pass a complex test in order to install this software. You must be able to download an application. That's it. Now, if you happen to own an iPhone, you must remember your iTunes password in order to install an application. And so far, I have found that this is the most difficult part of becoming part of the global economy of Bitcoin, is remembering your iTunes password. <laughs> but if you can do that, if you can access the Google Play Store, if you have basic familiarity with mobile applications, if you can download an EXE on Windows and install it, if you can double-click a mouse, that's it. You don't have to provide your name, your email address, you don't register or create an account, you don't have to prove who you are, where you are, or show that you are worthy. You do not have to have a credit score. You do not have to be authorized. This is something that is entirely different from every system of money we've ever had before. Now for the internet generation, this is a very familiar concept. When you open a browser and you start using the web, do you have to register or get a license to use the web? Do you have to create an account to visit Wikipedia? No. The only requirement is that you are able to download, install, and operate a web browser. There was a time when the idea of allowing every human to be able to communicate without borders or censorship on the World Wide Web was terrifying to people. To some people, it still is terrifying. Most of the younger generation find it liberating in a global sense. Bitcoin does that to money. What happens when every human being on the planet, through the simple act of downloading and installing an application, can become a member of a global economy without borders, one that allows people to transmit and receive money at will, anywhere in the world, 24 hours a day, uninterrupted for the last seven years, with fees that do not depend on the amount of money you are sending, but pay simply for the capacity you use on the network. You can transmit a Bitcoin transaction for about one dollar, and it doesn't matter if you send one or a hundred thousand dollars, you still pay one dollar. It doesn't matter if you're sending it from here to another province in Malaysia, or if you're sending it from here to the opposite end of the planet. It doesn't matter if you are an individual or corporation, or if you're sending it to an individual or corporation. It doesn't matter if you're sending it to someone who is rich or someone who is poor. You can. Bitcoin changes the way we approach finance completely. But that's just the first layer. Because the technology that makes Bitcoin possible, that allows two people from opposite ends of the planet to securely transact with each other without knowing each other and without trusting each other, opens up 
an entire range of applications that we haven't yet imagined. Bitcoin is not just money for the internet. Bitcoin is a platform. The technology that Bitcoin uses, a combination of the blockchain, which is the global transaction ledger that records every transaction, the decentralized consensus mechanism called proof of work that allows security on the Bitcoin blockchain, the open system of access that allows anyone to participate without barriers, and its borderless and neutral nature that make it possible for anyone to participate regardless of who they are. Where the only thing that matters is whether a transaction is valid, not who is the source or destination, not what is the amount. These fundamental building blocks that make Bitcoin possible open the door to dozens and then hundreds and then thousands of applications of trust. At its core, Bitcoin represents the replacement of trust through institutions to trust through networks. For centuries, human society has been based on the fact that in order to coordinate the activity between large numbers of people, we have to have something to trust. And until now, the best answer to that problem was institutions. Collections of people governed by rules and policies, with oversight, transparency and accountability built into the rules, run by humans, in order to create centers of trust through tradition, through reputation, through longevity. Institutions of trust are failing. They are failing all over the world. They are failing when they are newspapers. They are failing in political institutions. They are failing in numbers of ways. And the reason they are failing is because they represent systems of scale for industrial societies. And we are no longer industrial nation-state societies. We are now information societies of global scale that collaborate across borders at massive scale. We are now solving problems that affect not 30 million people in one country, but 7.5 billion people on one planet. And for problems of that scale and collaboration of that scale, traditional institutions do not work. They fail to scale. They are not evil. They are not deliberately corrupt. They simply fail to solve the problems of a global society. And yet, during that very time that we see these institutions failing, we have seen the emergence of new systems of governance, of new systems of global collaboration, systems that do allow us to collaborate, communicate, and solve problems at scale. And the first of those systems was the internet. And with that, we see the first system of communication that transcends nations, that transcends borders that allows anyone everywhere and anywhere to communicate. Bitcoin represents that happening to money. It represents a network-centric system of money that is beyond the nation-state. A network-centric system of money that scales and allows people to collaborate on a global basis, that allows anyone everywhere and anywhere to participate in a global economy, without barriers, without borders, without ID, without credentials, simply through the act of running software. And that will change the world. Thank you.
and his newest book is, just came out eight days ago called The Internet of Money, which is a masterpiece to read. Please help me welcome Andreas Antonopoulos. Good morning, everyone. Let's start with a quick uh, poll here. How many of you have used a digital currency like Bitcoin at least once? And how many of you own Bitcoin at this moment, or any other digital currency? Okay, we can fix that. <laughs> if you like, later on today, come find me. I would be delighted to demonstrate to you how to set up a Bitcoin wallet on your smartphone. and I will give you your first fraction of a Bitcoin, not a whole Bitcoin, and show you how a transaction works. Because Bitcoin and the digital currency revolution it has started is best demonstrated and experienced than explained. It is actually very difficult to explain Bitcoin. I have spent the last five years learning how to explain Bitcoin. That is my full-time job. Unfortunately, the developers keep making new stuff, which I then have to explain all over again. So, for a moment, forget everything you think you know about Bitcoin. Forget everything you've heard about blockchain, and let's start from basics. In 2011, I heard about Bitcoin for the first time. And my reaction was exactly the same as the reaction of everybody else who heard about Bitcoin the first time, including its founder. And that reaction was, ha! Nerd money. That's probably just for gambling. Six months later, I heard about Bitcoin again. And this time, I read the white paper that launched this system. And my background in computer science and distributed systems allowed me to see behind the illusion of what I thought Bitcoin was, and it blew my mind. In my life, I have now had six occasions in which I have become absolutely obsessed with a system of technology to the point of forgetting to eat, forgetting to sleep, and consuming as much knowledge as I possibly can. My first computer when I was 10 years old. My first programming language experience. My first modem. My first access to the web, the first time I used the web browser. The first time I downloaded and installed the Linux operating system. And then Bitcoin. When I discovered it, I spent four months consuming as much as I could, except food. I lost 26 pounds on the highly inadvisable diet of obsession. I have not emerged from that, because I keep finding new layers of depth to understand this. And the reason it is so fascinating is because it isn't what it appears to be at first glance. Bitcoin isn't money. The blockchain isn't a system of currency. It is a platform of trust. It is not a company. It is not a product. It is not a service you sign up for. It is not a currency. Currency is just the first application. It is the concept of decentralization applied to the human communication of value. Because what is money? NQ told us it is an illusion. It is imaginary. And the reason we don't grasp that is because it is so deeply embedded in our civilization. Money is one of the oldest technologies that humanity has. It precedes writing. 
How do we know that? The very first samples of writing we have are spreadsheets. <laughs> they are tallies and ledgers of debts owed, and money pre-existed that writing. You might even speculate that money had an oral tradition until it needed to invent a written tradition, so writing was created for it. In the history of money that now spans tens of thousands of years, there have been maybe five major changes. From pure barter exchange to the introduction of the first abstraction of value, shells, feathers, beads, nuts, stones, and then precious metals, and then paper money, and then plastic money, and now network money. Bitcoin introduces a platform on which you can run currency as an application on a network without any central points of control, a system completely decentralized like the internet itself. It is not money for the internet, but the internet of money. And what is money? Money is a language. Money is a linguistic abstraction. Money is a language that we use to communicate value to each other. Money simply allows us to express value, and that value may have economic consequences, but it also has other consequences. We use money to express and create social bonds and relationships and associations and to create organization. Bitcoin is the first system of money that is not controlled by any entity, that is completely decentralized. And what that does is it introduces the very same things that the internet brought to communication. If money is speech, if money is a language, and you disconnect it from all other media, and you make it pure speech, pure content, an internet content type, a protocol designation, money over IP. It completely separates it from all of these previous notions of nations, sovereign issuers, institutions that control. And so we go from institution-based money to network-based money. And of course, everyone will welcome this with open arms. Not a chance. What do you think they said the first time someone was presented with a gold depository certificate instead of a gold coin? They said, that's not money. Go away. What do you think happened in 1950, the first time someone showed up at a motel and presented their diner's club membership card and said, I'll pay with this piece of paper. That's not money. Go away. And now we're on the verge of a new transformation of money. We're on the verge of creating the first completely global, completely borderless, completely decentralized, and completely open form of money. One where you can build applications, because this money is programmable. And you don't need to ask anyone's permission to launch an application any more than you need to ask permission to launch an application on the internet. And the only requirement to have a successful application on the internet of money is two interested participants. That is your market segment, and you have an application. 
and a million applications will flourish. When you push innovation to the edges of the network, when you remove the requirement for permission, what happens? Exponential explosion in innovation. The applications that could not be built on the old systems of money because they required permission, because they required a significantly large market segment, because they required adoption by many in order to be available at all. Now, none of those requirements exist. Anyone in the world can download an application or use even a feature phone with text messaging and immediately acquire the same powers that institutions of banking have today. And when I say anyone, that's only scratching the surface. Because ironically enough, not only does Bitcoin and blockchain currency not recognize borders, it also does not recognize people. It doesn't matter if you are a person, or a refrigerator, or a self-driving car. Throughout the history of money, ownership of currency required personhood, either as an individual or as an association of individuals in a corporation. Bitcoin can be owned by machines. Bitcoin can be owned by software agents. Machines can pay each other. And that is not just about economic activity. It's the basis for market-based security systems. It's the basis for creating bonds of authentication between devices. It's the basis of new applications that have never been done before. Bitcoin and blockchain technology unifies the systems of money. Today we have systems of money for small payments, systems of money for large payments. We have systems of money for payments between individuals, we have systems of money for payments between companies. We have systems of money for payments between governments. Does that remind you of something? That's how communication used to be before the internet. We had systems of communication for pictures, systems of communication for letters, systems of communication for short distance and long distance, and the internet came and unified all of those. What the internet of money does is it creates a single network which can do a microtransaction to a giga transaction in seconds anywhere in the world for any participant without permission but if you just look at the application of money you're missing the point because you can take the language the building blocks of this platform and use them to construct other languages that communicate value Tokens, reward points, brand loyalty coins. Today there are over a thousand digital currencies using the design pattern, the recipe of Bitcoin. Most of them are junk. Some of them are not. And over the next decade, we are going to see tens of thousands and then hundreds of thousands of coins. Some will have economic use, some will simply be expressions of loyalty, affiliation. They will represent items in the physical world, the title for a house, the controlling key for a car that can be transferred from one owner to another. And five seconds later, that owner can step into the car and drive away, because the car can validate the new standard of ownership. We cannot yet imagine what applications we are going to build around this. But one of the interesting things we are beginning to observe is that money arises out of the social construct of Homo sapiens spontaneously. It even arises in primates. You can teach monkeys money. You can teach dolphins money. You can teach greys, parrots, money. And they will learn how to exchange abstract tokens for food, and then use them to build social relationships. They will also invent 
strong arm robbery. Beat up the other monkey, take away its pebbles, eat the bananas. And we see that same thing happen in children. Toddlers invent money in kindergarten. Blocks and rubber bands and Pokemon cards and other little tokens, abstractions of value that they exchange to strengthen social bonds, to express loyalty and friendship, to learn about sharing. Children will be building currencies. Only this time, these currencies will be global, unforgeable, and scalable on day one. A few years from now, Maria will be launching Maria Coin in her kin kindergarten to compete against Joey Coin. And it won't really matter to anyone until, of course, Justin Bieber launches Justin Bieber Coin. And it happens to surpass the market capitalization of 30 nations on this planet. And we are all writing horrified opinion editorials about how the world is going to hell. <laughs> What's happening with this technology is astonishingly deep. And for certainly some of the companies in this room, it's a bit scary. Banking has never been the most innovative sector in the world, because there is a very careful balance between innovation and the conservative fiduciary duty that exists in banking, that must exist when you control other people's money. And yet with Bitcoin, you don't control other people's money. In Bitcoin, I control my money. I have complete and total authority over my Bitcoin. It cannot be seized, it cannot be frozen, it cannot be censored. My transactions cannot be intercepted, and they cannot be stopped. And I can do so with almost complete anonymity, and so can anyone five minutes after they download an application, and money has changed forever, and banking has changed forever. The idea that you can proceed in the industry of money, in the industries of commerce, and maintain the same conservative attitude that has existed now for centuries, ever since merchants, in Venice and Amsterdam started issuing depository certificates and providing banking services. That is gone. That is gone. You cannot operate closed systems that have borders and require permission to join at a rate of innovation that is controlled by the most conservative tendencies within your organization, because now you are competing with a technology that enables exponential growth, exponential innovation at the edges, without permission by anyone in the world. And it is not about anyone in this room. Why? We represent the privileged elite. I can go onto a brokerage account, open it up online, and be trading on the Tokyo stock market within 12 hours in yen. That is the privilege that I have. One and a half billion people have that privilege. Six billion people can operate mainly in one currency, and perhaps have some basic banking services. Four billion people are significantly underbanked, and an astonishing two and a half billion people are completely unbanked. They will leapfrog. They will never have a relationship with a bank. Every single child born today will never have a bank account. They will have a bank app. A bank app that doesn't give them an account. A bank app that makes them a banker, an international banker, in an app. 
they will not be permitted to open a bank account until they're 16 years old. By that time, I hope they will have at least six or more years of experience with digital currencies. And I would like to watch them walk into a bank branch to have someone explain to them what three to five business days means. <laughs> it is highly likely that children born today will never get a driving license, because they will have self-driving cars, but they will also never use paper money. Because by the time they get to an age where they really start using money, there is no paper money. It will seem as anachronistic as a fax machine or horse and buggy seems to us. Exponential innovation on a global basis, giving access to the other six billion. They have enormous need, and this system offers them a solution. It's not ready yet. It's nascent. It's complex. It's impossible to use for most people. In 1989, I sent my first email. In order to do so, I had to compile a version of the Unix mail program using a C compiler and Unix command line skills. I had to set it up on the command line, type out my email, and that email was transmitted across the great internet in an astonishing three days. Exactly 20 years later, my mother replicated that experience with a swipe. Bitcoin today and all of the currencies that are built on that recipe are just at the same level that the internet was in 1991. Only now, we have the internet. And so the rate of exponential growth has already started. The innovation is growing at an astonishing rate. I spend every single day full time trying to keep up with Bitcoin. Just one currency, and it's almost impossible. Do not underestimate this. Do not listen to the people who tell you that Bitcoin is just for pornographers, terrorists, drug dealers, and gamblers. Remember that they said the exact same thing about the internet. And when you give it to two or three billion people, they are not interested in those things. They are interested in sharing cat videos. <laughs> and now we have an internet of a billion cat videos. When you take digital currency mainstream and give it to the four billion people who have been isolated from international finance and commerce, and you give them the opportunity to control their money against despotic governments and corrupt banks that are stealing from them, you give them the opportunity to control their future, you give them the opportunity to transact with everyone in the world, to own title on their own property, in a fully transferable digital token that is recognized everywhere. Control over finance that cannot be seized, frozen, or censored. They will buy food, health care, sanitation, education, shelter, because that is what we do. And they will not be denied this technology. Do not underestimate where this is going. The Internet of Money was launched on January 3, 2009. It's coming. It's coming faster than you can imagine. It's deeper than you can fathom. It's more sophisticated than you can immediately understand. It takes years of study just to see all of the implications. And it is a gift to the entire world, a technology that represents the sixth greatest innovation in the technology of money, the most ancient technology of our civilization. Thank you.
Should we do some questions? We've got plenty of time for questions. Christian. What determines the buying power of the currency? How does it stabilize and what's required to stabilize it? So if I would buy some bitcoins, who can manipulate the value of that? Um, everyone. <laughs> the buying power of bitcoin is determined in exactly the same way that the buying power of the euro, the British sterling, the Japanese yen, or the US dollar is determined through market forces of supply and demand in international liquid markets that operate around the clock. One of the fundamental differences is that Bitcoin trading never ceases. has been going continuously for seven years. The network never stops. Every ten minutes, Bitcoin's heart beats, and transactions are processed. The exchanges never close. There is no closing price for Bitcoin. It is a rolling average. And in that trading, a market capitalization of approximately $12 billion is now traded internationally. What is $12 billion for a global currency? It's a guppy swimming in shark-infested waters. <laughs> and every trader, every whale goes in there and just kicks that price around. So right now, the experience of living on Bitcoin, which I have been doing full-time for more than three years, is a roller coaster. It's an absolute roller coaster. I've seen shifts of 20 or 30 percent in a day. And yet, if you look at the long-term trend, volume goes up, transactions go up, and volatility keeps dropping. And the beauty of it is, I can't sell that to an American, I can't sell that to a Brit. I don't need to sell it to an Argentinian. I don't need to sell it to a Brazilian. I don't need to sell it to a Venezuelan. I went to a conference and an Argentinian told me, I'm not worried about volatility. Our currency has volatility like this. Bitcoin has volatility like this. I'd rather be going in that direction. And you don't need to tell them why. Their government threw people out of airplanes not more than 35 years ago for disagreeing. They already know why the separation of state and money is a good idea. <laughs> and so volatility is relative. Any other questions? Come on. Yeah. Let's get a microphone to you one second. Um, yeah, okay, so only one oh. uh, short sorry. Where are we? There you are. Um, sorry. Thanks. Uh, great, great speech. Um, obviously, it, it sounded a little bit like one side of the coin. Um, so we also read um, uh, all these, you know, big hacks, and I don't know, on Bitfinex, you know, they, I, th I think they stole 40 percent of the money. Um, I think also this, this uh, autonomous organization have been hacked, and, and all these things. Can you just reflect a little bit on, on the, on the dark side, or, or of, of those aspects that might not uh, win our full trust into this evolution? Absolutely. The steering wheel was not invented until 30 years after the automobile was introduced. Why? Because the first automobiles had two leather straps that you pulled left or right to move the car, to steer the car. They used horse reins to steer cars. That's called skeomorphic design. It means keeping a shadow of the former past in your new system, failing to see the new dimension, and replicating the past. Here is a currency that is not centralized, where your money is your money. Your keys, your money. Not your keys, not your money. So what is the first thing we do with this new system? We build centralized institutionals of custodial control that take other people's money and hold it for them. Well, guess what? The entire history of banking, the entire system of regulation and oversight, is based on the simple centuries-old understanding that when somebody else holds your money, chances are they are going to run away with it. And the entire system of regulation is designed to prevent that, and yet it still happens all the time. 
in hedge funds, in banks, in national currencies all the time. And so, of course, if you replicate custodial accounts, exchanges that take other people's Bitcoin and concentrate it, it happens again. Even worse, because there are no oversights and regulations in most of these spaces. The answer is really simple. Stop centralizing the decentralized currency. Stop trying to replicate the banking past in the future of money. And the important thing to realize is that security in Bitcoin is an emergent property that exists because of the decentralization of control and power. If I want to hack a million customers' Bitcoin and they're holding their keys, I have to hack a million customers. If they all give their keys to one person or one organization, then we've got a honeypot. A honeypot that attracts the attention of every hacker on the planet. And notice what's happened. Over seven years, and with a market capitalization of $12 billion, Bitcoin is the largest cryptographic deployment in the world, the largest public key infrastructure in the world, the largest security honeypot in the world. And it is not secure because it doesn't get attacked. It is secure because it generates immunity by being attacked all the time, 24 hours a day by the most sophisticated attackers this planet has. And if you, in that environment, set up a centralized custodial exchange using PHP and MySQL, <laughs> and you park a $150 million honeypot in there, you are inviting the sharks. Bitcoin banks get hacked. Bitcoin exchanges get hacked. Bitcoin has not been hacked and cannot be hacked because there is no point of control that you can apply pressure on. It is completely decentralized. All right, maybe one more question? Yes. Where does supply of Bitcoin come from? And how do you, are you sure the market doesn't get oversupplied? Um, the supply of Bitcoin is determined algorithmically based on a geometrically declining supply function, meaning that in the beginning, every 10 minutes, 50 new Bitcoin are created. So every block, the heartbeat, 10 minutes, created 50 new Bitcoin. This Bitcoin is used as a reward in a game theory based security model that ensures that every transaction is independently validated by completely anonymous actors who have to stake electricity as a guarantee of the security work they've done. And if they succeed in doing the security work of validating transactions correctly, they earn as a reward, based on a probabilistic return, that reward. 50 Bitcoin every 10 minutes. That's how currency is introduced into the economy. Every four years, it gets cut in half. 50 to 25 in November of 2012. And this year in July, this past July, we had our second halving event, which was celebrated with birthday parties all over the world. And Bitcoin's reward went from 25 to 12 and a half Bitcoin. As a system, it's designed to have a monetary policy that is purposefully deflationary and simulates the issuance of precious metals. It gets harder and harder and harder to mine gold at greater and greater and greater cost. And Bitcoin is the same. The idea being that less and less is issued over time. If you follow that geometric curve, at some point you reach the end. In the year 2141, Bitcoin is no longer issued. 21 million coins is the asymptotic cap. It will never reach 21 million coins. That is part of the protocol. It is an unchangeable part of the protocol, and it is a rule enforced by every system that participates in the Bitcoin network. It is meant to be sound money, but it is not the only monetary policy that exists. There are several other currencies that implement different monetary policies. The idea is really for Bitcoin to serve as a very, very solid reserve currency for many other things. Please. What advice do you have to give to 
companies here who are from non-financial institutions about how they should take tactical steps to think about experimenting with the blockchain in terms of storing value? I think understanding that it's not just currency, understanding that it is a platform for trust, understanding that it can be used as a historical record of truths that can register information, that it can be used to create all kinds of tokens that can be exchanged between your customers, your suppliers, your manufacturers. That it can also be used simply as a currency for any cross-border transactions, import-export activities, remittances-based flows, uh, paying associates and affiliates, all of the things that today are expensive, slow, and difficult, become cheap, fast, and easy when you use one of these digital currencies. But it's still early. For now, learning about it. Here's the one important thing you must understand. You will hear a lot about blockchain. And most of what you hear about blockchain is not the internet of money. It is the intranet of money. The intranet is where you run front page, an outlook, an antiquated software, and a closed little enclave of your corporate backwaters with stale content and boring apps. And in the end, it's full of viruses anyway, because you can't keep it secure. Blockchain that is not open, that is not public, that is not borderless, that is not open for innovation, is not what we're talking about here. And that's a really important distinction. It may be useful if you want to run a clearinghouse between three banks, maybe. But it's not the internet of money. Thank you so much, Andrea. Thank you. By the way, Everybody who asked a question gets a free copy of my book. Come and see me in the back there. Thank you so much. Thank you. And we're going to kick off with a keynote on the future of money. So it really is about looking forward. We're going to have a future stargazing session this morning, and someone who doesn't need a lot of introduction to other than to say he is a world-class expert in his field, has come to South Africa to talk to us. Andreas Antonopoulos, welcome to South Africa and welcome to the conference. Hi, good morning everyone. I am so excited to be here. Um, so, this uh, conference was called the Bitcoin Conference a couple of years ago, and now it's the Blockchain Conference. Next year it's going to be the DLT technology. Uh, and then after that, it's going to be the database inspired by, but no longer in any way related to blockchain conference. <laughs> it's an interesting progression. Let me do a quick poll of the audience. I want to uh, get an idea of um, your level of experience and familiarity with this space. So I'm going to go back to the yesteryears of Bitcoin. How many of you uh, currently own Bitcoin? Fantastic. And um, those who don't own Bitcoin, how many of you have conducted a transaction or seen a transaction happen in Bitcoin? Great. And how many do not own any cryptocurrency of any type? Okay, great. How about people who are involved with Ethereum and own Ethereum? Great. Dash. Monero, Zcash. Got some interesting ones. Okay, how many own blockchain? Uh, how many have used blockchain in a transaction, or in any way, other than the five things I mentioned previously? All right. Okay. So breakdown for you, for those who can't see what the audience is doing. About sixty to seventy percent have uh, Bitcoin at the moment or have conducted a transaction, about 30 or 40 percent with Ethereum, smaller minority with Dash, Monero, and Zcash. Uh, nobody owns blockchain. Um, and this is interesting. This is exciting. Great. So let's get started. What exactly is going on here? Is this the greatest technological innovation an explosion of innovation since the mobile internet 
or maybe even the internet itself? Or is this the greatest load of hype ever arranged around a technology in the history of technology? Both. And in fact, that's a characteristic of advanced technologies. I often say that where Bitcoin and the other open blockchains are today is approximately where the internet is in 1992. In terms of technology, in terms of infrastructure deployment, in terms of adoption patterns, this technology is approximately where the internet was in 1992. But the hype around blockchain is exactly where the hype around the internet was in 1998. You know what comes next. There will be a shakeout. When the waters recede, you can tell who on the beach wasn't wearing a swimsuit. <laughs> they stand there naked. It's an empty promise. This will happen in the blockchain space. There is a lot, a lot of bullshit being peddled to VCs, to investors, to initial coin offering buyers, to uneducated investors. There's a lot of Ponzi schemes, there's a lot of pyramid schemes, there's a lot of empty promises. There's also a lot of business as usual disguised as innovation, disguised as disruptive technology. And so we're at this strange moment where the underlying technology really is, truly is, massively disruptive, massively innovative. The amount of research that's happening today in applied cryptography is unprecedented. We are looking at the largest civilian deployment of public key cryptography ever. Because it turns out that people only protect keys when those keys are attached to value, and nothing teaches someone security fast enough than having their Bitcoin on a Windows machine. <laughs> Holding your own Bitcoin very quickly changes your attitude towards information security. You didn't care about your photos. Some didn't even care about your sexy photos. You didn't care about your location, the fact that everything you do was tracked. You didn't care about posting your entire life on Facebook. You used the same password, password 1234, on 17 different sites. You didn't know what two-factor authentication was, and then Bitcoin happened. And suddenly you're on a steep learning curve and getting better every day. Now you're telling your friends about two-factor authentication, and you're horrified to remember how you used to practice security, because storing value has this unique ability to focus your mind on the aspects of security that matters. So this technology is driving this groundswell of security awareness. It's driving the most incredible research in applied cryptography we've ever seen. Some of you are probably quite technical. You're involved in computer science. You've seen what's happening here. Nobody thought that we would be doing applied Schnorr signatures. Nobody thought we'd be looking at advanced elliptic curve applications. Nobody thought we'd be doing things like ring signatures and range proofs for uh, confidential transactions. The state of anonymity and privacy is advancing rapidly. We're building a whole new world in terms of cryptography, and this is applied cryptography on the largest cryptographically secured network the world has ever seen. That's not business as usual. It's highly disruptive. Now, out of that came this fantastic saying, blockchain is the technology behind Bitcoin, which is incorrect. Blockchain is one of the four foundational technologies behind Bitcoin, and it can't stand alone. But that hasn't stopped people from trying to sell it. Blockchain is Bitcoin with a haircut and a suit that you parade in front of your board. 
It's the ability to deliver a sanitized, clean, comfortable version of blockchain, of Bitcoin, to people who are too terrified of actually disruptive technology. And so you get into this very strange world where the words no longer mean anything. Can you define blockchain for me? I think a few people in this room could probably define blockchain, but the real challenge would be, can you define blockchain in such a way that I can't do search and replace with the word database and still make that sentence work? Because that's the challenge. If what you're doing is a database with signatures, it's not interesting. It's boring. What is the essence of Bitcoin? It's not blockchain. The essence of Bitcoin is the ability to operate in a decentralized way without having to trust anyone. The essence of Bitcoin is to be able to use software to authoritatively, independently, without appeal to authority, verify everything yourself. You don't trust the other nodes you are talking to. You assume they are lying. You don't trust the miners. You don't trust the people creating the transactions. You don't trust anything other than the outcome of your own verification and validation. And through that, you end up trusting in something more important, the network effect. Bitcoin introduced the concept of decentralized security through computation. And this has not yet sunk in. What Bitcoin does is it allows you to replace a security model that is based around concentric circles of access and control with an institution in the center, with a security model that is inside out, open and accessible to everyone, a security model that is based on market forces and game theory. It is the first market-based security model, where a series of incentives and punishments ensure that the ultimate result is you can trust the platform itself as a neutral arbiter that is not controlled by anyone, without third parties, without intermediaries. Bitcoin revolutionizes trust. Now, it's difficult to have that conversation if you only focus on Bitcoin. And arguably, a lot of people have said, but it's not just about currency. What about the other applications? And it's not just about Bitcoin. What about the other blockchains? And so, in that sense, the term blockchain means something. But only if you define it very, very narrowly. I use the qualifier open to talk about open blockchain. What I'm interested in is the applications of this technology that enable you to run a decentralized, trustless system that does not rely on anyone as an intermediary of trust. Because that is the disruption here. That is the essence of this technology. So that essence is seen in other systems. Ethereum exhibits it for the application of smart contracts. But those smart contracts only work if you don't have to trust anyone to execute the smart contract correctly. And you can only trust that that's going to happen if everyone can participate in an open manner and verify each other. If access to the underlying consensus algorithm in mining is open to everyone. And so out of these characteristics come the power of these blockchain technologies. Open. And that's the key word. Borderless. There are no borders. Transnational. This is no longer about nation states. This is about network centric trust. Without third parties, the network is the trusted party, and only if you verify everything. Neutral, because it isn't serving the goals of any one organization or institution. It follows the consensus rules neutrally. Everyone follows the consensus rules neutrally. Your transaction, there is no such thing as a good transaction or a bad transaction. 
a valuable transaction or a spam transaction, an authorized transaction or an unauthorized transaction, a legal transaction or an illegal transaction. In these systems, there is only a valid or an invalid transaction based on the consensus rules. And it doesn't matter who the sender is, who the recipient is, or what the value or asset or smart contract that's being executed is. Neutrality, radical neutrality. And, of course, censorship resistance. The ability to ensure that in order for the system to be open, and borderless, and transnational, and neutral, it must be able to defend these properties by making it impossible for any actor, or even several colluding actors, from censoring, disrupting, blacklisting, restricting, seizing, freezing transactions, users, countries from participating in this network. Those are the important characteristics of these new, open, decentralized systems of trust that do not depend on institutions. So, what I'd like to equip you with is a set of criteria to understand when you are being presented with something, perhaps to invest, or to be employed, or to engage in some way. And it calls itself a blockchain, or a distributed ledger, or one of these other names that are coming out. How can you tell? Blockchain or bullshit? They both start with a B. What's the difference? If you can replace the word blockchain with database, and the brochure reads the same, it's business as usual. It's not decentralized. It's not borderless, neutral, censorship resistant, open. It reestablishes trust in intermediaries. It's just a database, and that is not disruptive. The idea that we're going to take this technology and use it to improve the operating margins of centralized institutions of trust so that they can continue business as usual. I'd, I'd say it's abhorrent, but that's a strong word. It's just boring. Really, really boring. No one got into this in order to make a few billions for a financial services clearinghouse. And if you did, I'm really sorry. That's boring. What's really exciting is the possibility of fundamentally changing the way we allocate trust on this planet, opening up the ability to collaborate, transact, engage on a global level with everyone. Simply by means of downloading an application, you can become part of a giant platform of trust that doesn't care who you are or where you came from, that doesn't require permission to participate or innovate. Where a 12-year-old JavaScript programmer has the same influence as power as J.P. Morgan Chase. More, in fact, because they're doing open source and feeding into a community of collaboration that is creating a tsunami of innovation. Taking this technology and using it to strengthen the same centralized institutions so that they can improve their bottom line is boring. That is not what blockchain is. That's just a database. And it doesn't change anything. In fact, there are some rather disturbing possibilities in this model. Let's think about it for a second. The most commonly expressed application for these new distributed ledger technologies is to replace the function of a centralized clearinghouse with a consortium of n participants, where n is 2, 3, 4, 5, 10 known, permissioned, controlled participants, 
who will assemble transactions and sign them, rather than compete through market forces in a security model like Bitcoin. We discard currency as the underlying mechanism for building market-based security. We discard proof-of-work as wasteful, because all it allows you to do is decentralized, secure, neutral, censorship-resistant blockchain. And we trust five named parties to sign transactions. At that point, they don't need to assemble these transactions in blocks. They can just sign the individual transactions. They don't need to chain them together, because absent proof of work and a system of currency incentives, rewriting that is easy. There is no immutability. So it's not a blockchain anymore, because there's no blocks and there's no chain. Now that's at a technical level. But let's look at the more important level. What do you achieve by replacing a clearinghouse with a consortium of players? You know, there's something unique a clearinghouse does. If you understand the role of a clearinghouse, one of its most important functions is that it is not a participant in the market. It has no skin in the game. The New York Stock Exchange is not an active trader. That's not an accident. That's called separation of concerns. The clearinghouse is an independent party with oversight that is not a market participant. If you take that party out and replace it with five banks, all of which have skin in the game, how do you run a consensus algorithm when the incentives to cheat, front-run, manipulate the market, and break the consensus rules, even adversarially against the other four parties, are so high? There is no incentive to keep the consensus rules. All you are doing is you're saying, trust us, we are in a consortium. Trust us? These five banks? Where were you in 2008? Where were you when Libor was fixed? Where were you when the gold markets were fixed? Where were you when front-running and high-frequency trading was creating these monsters of crony capitalism? Trust us? Hell no! Removing the clearinghouse and replacing it with... What's the word? It's not consortium. Cartel, that's the word. <laughs> with a cartel of the same market makers who have manipulated and compromised every market in history, and doing that in a way that closes this from transparency, that's not a recipe for efficiency, immutability, security, transparency. That's not a blockchain. That's a bullshit. It's a very profitable bullshit. It requires you to have confidence in the game, a con game, as it's known. Be careful what you evaluate when you see these technologies taking something whose fundamental purpose is to remove trusted intermediaries and create an open, borderless, neutral system, and turning it into a tool for a bunch of untrustworthy, trusted parties to manipulate markets is going to be a disaster, and they're going to do it. I have some consolation in the fact that their keys will leak. Because when you centralize a system, you have to keep the security of those five keys, and none of them have ever managed to do that. All of the companies involved in this brave new business-as-usual space have been hacked, breached, leaked, whistleblown a dozen times. They can't keep information secure. No one can. The whole point of a decentralized blockchain is you don't keep the information secure. You spread it out so thin, there's no place to attack it directly. That's what makes it secure. 
So what happens when you concentrate it among five participants? I can't wait until the anonymous WikiLeaks collaborative dump of the titans of Wall Street and their ledger of every transaction they've ever done. I can't wait. It's going to be so much fun, and it is going to happen. You cannot secure these things. So, does that mean there's nothing there? No. Again, we go back to the other side. There is an incredibly promising technology. And that technology is based on an architecture of openness. People are examining this market, and they're grasping and reaching out in darkness. When you have a brand new disruptive technology, you can't see the margins. It's like stumbling around a dark room. Somewhere in there is a billion-dollar company. Somewhere in there is an opportunity. And you have to figure out what market exists that will create opportunity, that will change the world, that will have an impact on humanity. Entrepreneurs look at other people's problems and see them as opportunities. When journalists in 1997 were writing about the imminent failure of the Internet because of the impossibility of finding anything, Larry Page and Sergey Brin were finding stuff and building a multi-billion dollar empire on solving the unsolvable problem of search. There are seemingly unsolvable problems in the open, decentralized, public, transparent, neutral, censorship-resistant, global, trustless network platform that is the blockchain and these other blockchains, Bitcoin, Ethereum, and the many other systems that are gradually trying to find their niche. Where are those markets? There are three elements to success in this industry. The first one is identifying a viable market. Right? You've got to stumble in the dark and find something useful. And very often, the people stumbling in the dark they don't find anything useful. Right? In 1997, Petco was building an online commerce empire for pet supplies. It was too early. The market didn't exist. Web grocer, web van, was delivering groceries to homes in San Francisco. Failed miserably. Was that the right market? Maybe. But it was the wrong time. So that's the second important element, right? Timing. You can identify something that at some point will be enormous, but you're off by a decade. And then the most important factor, sequencing, the prerequisites. Why did Facebook not happen in 1992? You didn't have enough density of adoption. You didn't have mobile devices that were permanently connected. You didn't even have home-based internet that was permanently on. You didn't have a dense social network in order to engage with the people you knew, because the people you knew barely had email, or didn't have email. Right? So you can't build a system of complexity that depends on many-to-many -many interaction with high density, when you're still doing applications that are one-to-one -one with low density. Right? It's like trying to fuse hydrogen directly into carbon. can't do that. You've got helium, lithium, beryllium. You've got a long way to go. Keep smashing things together before you get enough density that you can start doing interesting things in organic chemistry. Right? to use an example from science. Bottom line is, you can't do advanced real estate title applications, voting on the blockchain, retail markets. You can't do consumer-to-consumer uh, -consumer dense markets. You can't do points-of-sale retail with these systems yet. You can't do most of the things yet that might be very interesting markets. And the reason you can't do them is because there's not enough liquidity, there's not enough users, there's not enough adoption, the user interfaces are terrible, the applications are still at their infant stage. 
That doesn't mean these things can't happen. It just means they're not happening this year. We're going to see this play out. In order for people to have the trust to put the title of their home on this blockchain, it has to be able to secure not billions, but trillions of dollars in assets. And in order to be able to secure trillions of dollars in assets, it has to have liquidity and infrastructure. It has to have broad adoption. You are not going to get adoption on a transaction that most people do twice in their lifetime, when you can't even get them to use it for transactions they do every day. Right? We are not going to be doing digital identity so that everyone can have a bank account. Because it takes a long time until you have adequate adoption. For the first 15 years of the internet, the application was email. And not until everybody had it, had to have it, needed it for work, did we see the second layer emerge. Because that created the density of adoption. And currency is the email of blockchains. Payments are the fundamental infrastructure that will enable density of adoption. It is very, very enticing to say, this is about more than money. It is, absolutely. In the long term, the vision of this technology is far beyond money. But you can't build that unless you first build the money part. That is what creates the security. That is what creates the velocity, the liquidity, the infrastructure. That is what funds the entire ecosystem. And in the end, when we do deliver perhaps digital identity to people, it won't be so they can open a bank account. Because this isn't about banking the unbanked. It is about debanking all of us. Thank you.